about the income tax. Um, I'm wondering specifically who are, you know, can you give me an example of a sort of specific type of constituent that you feel like is, you know, can't handle this proposal as it's coming out? If you look at, um, I'm just looking at the tables of uh, the, you know, projected rate that people are going to be paying, um, you know, for example, uh, the if you're a married couple with no children uh, and your combined income is $100,000 a year, your total Alaska income tax is going to be uh, $1,700 and that's credited against your PFD and you still come out ahead with, with $300. So, I mean, is it the people that are making $100,000? Is it the people that are making $500,000? Is it the people that are making $50,000? Who is it specifically that can't you know, handle this income tax proposal. <coughs> Morning, Nat. Uh, if you take a real hard look at what this bill does, uh, you're 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 right. It's around seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars for a married couple with no children. Uh, that takes the second half of their permanent fund. The first half is kind of basically gone already because they're in this bill. They're going to use half your permanent fund for government. So now you've got basically just about all of it gone on your your income side. Uh, when they first came out with this income tax bill, it was different. It was very much like the old bill back in the 70s and up until 1980-something. Uh, that was a very simple bill. And the administration, Department of Revenue, said that it would cost about $50 million. That this what it was going to cost. Now this is a more complicated bill. It's going into areas where the, the federal government doesn't even tax. It's going after your children's trust. They're going to tax the, the, the trust all around it. And it's going to drive possibly, uh, we are a great state <coughs> to have lower 48 come up and they have their trust through Alaska because we don't have a state income tax. Uh, we, we put in the, that tax and we're probably going to lose all of that business that we uh, receive through those trusts. Uh, they'll go to the, one of the, the other three or four states that don't tax uh, trusts. So that's a, that's a big move also. But to administrate something this big, originally $50 million, what's it going to cost to do one that's this complicated? How many more people are they going to have to add? Is it going to make it instead of $50 million, $150 million to administrate this because it's so complicated? Uh, you start looking at it and the administration is going to have to redo their entire computer system to make this work. Uh, they're going to have to work with uh, businesses in the state so that they can get their computers up so they know what they're supposed to be withholding and be able to file it with the state. The, the state is going to have to work with all of the lower 48 big companies like TurboTax and some of those because it's so complicated. How is TurboTax going to do somebody's return in Alaska? They're going to have to redo all of that. It's, it's so complicated and so messed up that uh, this isn't going to be an easy thing to have in place by the time that it starts taking happen when it starts happening in 19, uh, 2019. So I see it as a major problem. Uh, so is it, where does it benefit us? Uh, the way that they have it set up, it's going to cost us more money, uh, the state way more money to administrate and to try to track and, and audit, if you want to say it. I will add briefly, uh, sure, uh, specifically, I represent the military district, Nat, and a lot of folks will retire in Alaska at, uh, if they put in 20 years, they get 50 percent of their pay. And uh, people are asking me, I get a lot of calls from constituents, veterans saying, is my pension going to be taxed? And uh, while it's a big bill and its providence is, is kind of suspicious, the answer is yes, your military pension will be taxed. And people might want to go back to their home of record. They might, might want to go outside someplace where it's warmer. So uh, this income tax might be the tipping point that puts one of my constituents who retired from the military in Eagle River to the point they're going to move down to California or Oregon and we'd lose the benefit of that person. And I think the, the question is even kind of flips things on its head. We shouldn't be asking how much tax we should be able to impose on Alaskans. We should decide first what level of government do we need, we think we need to have and then figure out how to pay for that. Not the first question being how much can we extract from Alaskans' pocketbooks and then have government be to that size. Should, it, should pensions, should people who are earning money from pensions not have to pay any tax? Well, somebody who's earned a pension has, especially in the military, has paid a, a large debt of service to the country already and has paid income tax on their, uh, on their income. So 
Uh, we get a lot of people who retire in Alaska because of that lack of income tax, and a lot of Alaskans are able to make it their home because of the lack of income tax. I don't want to take up too much time to other questions. Steve? Uh, Steve Quinn with Bloomberg. <clears throat> One of your um, caucus's remedies is uh, $600 million in cuts over the next three to four years. Why not lay out your plan for that $600 million now so the public can get engaged, so your peers know um, where that $600 million would come from, and if it means cuts for the agency, so the people who work at these agencies know where yeah. these cuts are coming from. And I've got an oil tax question. I've got a brief response, but, but go ahead. Steve. Yeah, uh, you know, Representative Wilson put in a lot of amendments that were sensible, that did take small amounts from each, and they were specifically as to where that money would, would uh, be reduced. Uh, they, those were not approved by uh, the present majority, and, uh, and unfortunately, though, that's what we need to do. We can't just sit here today and say, okay, we're going to cut 5 percent out of DOT, we're going to cut another 5 percent out of it. We have to be specific, and Representative Wilson did that very well in her amendments, and I was very pleased to um, back the majority of them. You know, every small amount that you can find in a budget that why are we doing this much money? Why are we paying this much in overtime for the divi di division of corrections when they have eight people shifted over to cover what overtime was paid? They have a full complement of employees now, so why are they budgeting for a whole bunch more overtime? They don't need it anymore because they just added eight employees that are also in the budget. So it's things like that that need to be specifically looked at, dug into, and come up with the right thing. You can't, you can't just sit here today and say, yeah, we're going we're gonna to cut $600 million over the next three, four years. We have to find out what that can be and make sure that we do it correctly. And we were headed there, but we couldn't get there because uh, we couldn't get cooperation. And I'll just reply very quickly that uh, we don't do five-year plans like the Soviet Union did. We, we actually budget year by year. And that gives us flexibility to adjust to changing situations to test whether programs are working effectively as designed or not. And so I think uh, making a budget decisions every year is a more appropriate way to go. And certainly we were able to set a long-term target and, and hit it. We've done so in the past. Okay. And on the oil tax, um, you know, I, I understand your position on greater uh, out throughput and things like that. But if you can't afford the system you have now, what do you do? So I think that the, the Senate's taking a look at all of HB 111, and um, and from what I've heard, there's you know there's maybe some some sense that we might have to adjust the tax credits, but this this large scale um, omnibus rewrite of the of of the oil tax law is is beyond. I mean, it's just kind of be beyond even we have the time to even look at as, as far as doing all the projections and so on. So, I mean, this doesn't mean that there's nothing that needs, that, that, that everything is perfect in the oil tax uh, bill, or I mean in the oil tax law, but it does mean that this is not the time to be doing a wholesale rewrite of the entire tax code for, for oil taxes. And that's what uh, 111 does. It just does too much and, and introduces a tremendous amount of uncertainty <coughs> into uh, oil you know, just in the whole oil beyond beyond how much price per barrel is. I mean, we have enough uncertainty as it is. It's a uh, it's a complete rewrite of SB 21. Uh, instead of just addressing the big problem of exploration credits, which is what everybody thought that they were going to try to do, they're rewriting the entire tax on that was in SB 21. Right now, the way it reads, and what I've been able to look into is that. It increases taxes heavily. If oil goes to $20 a barrel, we'll have $400 million more collected in taxes from those companies. At $20 million, they're going to be broke or not making money. But at $20 a barrel, it'll still increase $400 million to taxes. And I think that's the wrong direction. If we want to look at it and carve out uh, Exploration credits, that's one thing. But to start increasing taxes at the same time, I think that's a mistake. Uh, what we have is working. We're increasing production. And seven changes in 12 years is a little bit much. And I think we've got to set back and see where we, what we are accomplishing. Because right now, we're accomplishing the right thing. We're putting more oil in the line. Andrew? Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Radio Network. Um, 
For Representative Cop, you mentioned uh, the importance of reducing uh, suicides. Um, the uh, Senate budget decreases health and social services by 5%, and public safety by 1%. Presumably, the next two years would see similar reductions. Are you concerned about the impact of state budget reductions on suicide prevention? Um, we're all concerned about every uh, budget reduction impact. Uh, again, it's um, uh, you know it, it's something that even though there are reductions, there still are prioritizations within the, the budget, and I think that while the concern is how can we address public health under a time where we have uh, fiscal constraints, we are starting to work collectively in a way that prioritizes every resource we have driving toward that end. And I think as a state, we no longer see it as a, as a urban rural divide issue, but as a, as, a, as a really a state issue that we all own. And so I think regardless of what that bottom line budget number is, the priorities are going, I've talked with the Recover Alaska folks, talked with uh, Jeff Jesse uh, with Mental Health Trust. I've talked with um, rural leaders, uh, village elders. There is a sense that we're, we're, we can turn the corner on this and that um, even with the, the reduced budget, there are other things going on in relationships and partnerships um, and working, at, working together in ways we have not before that are driving at um, having a, uh, an emotionally and spiritually and um, uh, uh, just stronger communities that can resist um, the whole tendency towards suicide. Thank you for the question. And if I could add to that real briefly, uh, I think that a strong private economy strengthens the social fabric across the state. Uh, we do support in our caucus uh, re strong resource development. We think oil and gas development is good for the state. We think that I think that mining uh, supporting uh, supporting mining in rural areas is good. So if you've got a job, you've got something to live for. You have a positive outlook and a reason to get up and go to the work in the morning, and your whole family is stronger, and the incidence of suicide is going to be lower. Liz Rains with KTV again. Uh, Representative Johnson, you mentioned the Real ID Act. Uh, that was passed more than 10 years ago, and there was a, another resolution by the Alaska legislature that didn't convince Congress to repeal it. Um, given that outlook, uh, do, are you supportive of the governor's bill that would comply with the act so that Alaskans don't have to spend $100 on a passport to get on base or to travel? <coughs> You know, it, it's one of the, is, is it an either or? Um, do we have to comply? Um, I'd like to, I don't even want to quite go there yet and start to spend the state money on an unfunded mandate, something that we're forced to do by the federal government. I'd like to stand up and, and stand up and stand with the other. There's five states that are absolutely no, no way are they going to make their state ID <clears throat> a compliant real ID. There's 19 states that are also pushing back. We're not, we're not just one single state out there. We're just the one state that's impacted the most. So before we go to spending a million and a half dollars to implement something that's for the benefit of the federal government and puts all of our our um, data privacy uh, our data in a in a data bank that's controlled by a not a government agency but by a non a nonprofit that's contracted with the government well I'm just not ready to quite go there yet and pay for the privilege so I'm I, I would I am not not supportive of, of the governor's bill right now and I think there's ways to work around and and uh, work beyond that. The full implementation is not until 2020. Good. That brings us to 930, so I will thank you all for being here, and uh, I guess we can hang out for more individual questions, but thanks very much for being here. We'll see you next Thursday.